I'm Jeff Russo. We're going to talk about mm, film and television music that uh, I get to create here in the studio. Um, we'll probably talk a little bit about Fargo, and ooh, I should probably turn my phone off. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for uh, inviting, inviting me here to talk about a new studio. It's a, a real honor, so You're thank welcome. you so much. Thanks for being here. Well, to, uh, let's start off, you know, start off from the very beginning. I'd like to talk maybe a little bit about your uh, your childhood and kind of uh, the certain events that led up to you finding music. What, what, what were the elements there that kind of came into play and kind of got you on that on that path? Starting, you know, out? I've been playing music of some sort since I was um, really young. You know, I was like seven or eight. Mm -hmm. Sort of tinkering on my uncle's piano. I didn't have a piano at home. I would go to my uncle's house and. Somehow I just sort of started playing and making some music on it. And then um, my mom said, pick an instrument at, stu you know, at, at, uh, at, at school, and I, I picked violin. So I played violin for a year. And I was just one of those kids that never could stick with one thing. So like mm -hmm. in fourth grade, I played violin. In fifth grade, I played clarinet. In sixth grade, I played snare drum. And that sort of changed my life. Then all of a sudden, I was like, wait, drums? Like, you can hit stuff and make <laughs> cool noises? Um, so I started doing that. And then it's one of those things. My father died when I was 12. So after my dad died, my mom, as one of those sort of like give the kid whatever he wants because his mm -hmm. dad just died gifts, bought me a drum set. Wow. I started playing drums. And um, that was really what I started doing. And then I got in a band. Well, you were um, still into uh, well, well, like big, big band. Well, like, no, I, I got it. I got into like we we were like just doing covers, and uh -huh. I was playing drums. We were doing like Bruce Springsteen <laughs> covers and the Cars. It was kind of fun. Um, and then one day, I was like hanging with my friends in the band, and I was like, oh, you know, that guy up there is, looks like he's having fun. The guy on the guitar, and I was like, that seems kind of fun. And that night, we all smoked a lot of pot <laughs> and listened to um, Pink Floyd, The Wall, which I, do. Yeah. I had never heard it. I had wow, never heard so it at the time. That was your first time. Yeah, so the guy was like, you got to listen to this. You got to listen to this record. So we listened to this song. It was called Mother. And there's this really great guitar solo. It's very melodic. You know, Dave Gilmore, who is my favorite guitar player in the world, he, he plays this very melodic style. And um, all of a sudden, I was like, I forget the drums. I got to play guitar. guitar yeah and then that sort of became my my um entryway into like really really getting serious about music and then after high school i drove across country here started a rock band and then so you came here for to start a band right or, out of high school so just uh, why why did you pick la was it, was it a big music scene at the time well you know i so i i, I grew up knowing this guy his name is lenny kravitz i'm sure you know who he is mm -hmm. um and <laughs> we we met when i was like 15 and um, he was making music in New York, and I was making music with this this other kid, and we the three of us got in a um, a car and drove across country, uh, essentially to to make music when we got here. Right. And Lenny was going to produce because he was already at the time he was known as Romeo Blue. This is before he was uh, uh. <laughs> before he was uh, Lenny Kravitz, um, and. We just became really close friends, and we lived in a loft downtown LA, and we had a little wow. studio, we were making music. And then at some point we went back to New York, and Lenny started making his record. Right. And this kid that I was working with, um, his name was Aramis, we started writing songs together. And um, then cut to like two or three years later, I quit that band. Um, and then met this other guy who I'd known since I was in high school. His name is Emerson. We started a band, Tonic, and then right. we sort of made our first record and then toured around for a very long time. Wow. Yeah. That was my entryway into being a professional musician. Right. Um, and then some long time after that, I, I started getting into doing this film, film and television. <laughs> yeah. You. It seems to be, and I see this, a, a trend, a lot of guys uh and girls whatever you know get into rock and roll into band into performing they find their way here somehow into to film and television composing i mean you look at danny elfman and hans zimmer and a lot of the the names you associate with film music uh john williams was a you know guitarist and, and jazz musician and lalo schifrin and kind of in the more of the performance side of things what is what do you think is about cliff martinez red and hot chili peppers like right. well, what brings you guys to this medium kind of after doing the whole well, you still do it, but I mean, just like, what, what, what's, what's the, what's the appeal for you, I well, guess? Well, you know, 
as a as a writer you have this drive to mm -hmm. want to continue to create music so I mean I can sit in a bubble and write music right you know um, it seems I enjoy and I'm I, I can't speak for any of the other people okay. you're talking about but I, for you, yeah. personally <laughs> it's like I enjoy writing music for a pur with a purpose mm -hmm. you know like with the band we'd sit down and we'd write songs and the end result was we were gonna make a record and go play it in front of people right. you know um, some of our favorite composers like they would write music and then they would perform it for people like you know the, or they would have orchestras perform it or, or whatever and I think that you know after being in a band and, and touring around and, and writing songs and and um, playing for people you want to stretch out and do the same thing in other ways it's mm -hmm. just another creative extension you know um, so I think that the, that the, the the allure of it is you get to continue to do that thing right. but yeah. oh it's in this other thing like it's a completely different type of creation you know right, yeah. um, when I'm sitting and writing a song I'm not thinking really about anything other than what the song is when I'm sitting and writing a, a, a piece of music for for a, a film or, or a TV show it's like you know you're creating from a completely different point of view all of a sudden you get to choose what your point of view is it, it can be the point of view of the producer or point of view of the character or point of view of, of the director or anybody and um, that it always posed an interesting um, uh, it, it conundrum you know mm. it's like well no, I'm used to writing from my own perspective and now I can switch around this perspective um, maybe it's not a conundrum but it was certainly a challenge <laughs> and 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 the I'm always I'm always interested in the challenge. So, when I started being able to write music for for film and television, it, it just seemed like a very natural sort sort of shift in um, in my ability to continue to be creative. You know? Right. You know, there's a lot of uh, you know I'm not a composer, I'm not a musician, but there are a lot of musicians and composers who do listen to these interviews. Uh, what were those kind of big hurdles for you when you were starting your starting your career and kind of getting into here? What was kind of the the challenge to really I guess get the career going. I mean, I know it changes kind of over time, and the industry is always evolving and changing. But when you were doing it, what were the kind of the challenges you faced? Well, you know, it's it's interesting because I, so I have or had or have and had a career as a performing artist right. and a recording artist, you know, with my band. So in two thousand five, two thousand six, like we had been um, we'd been touring for like twelve years, and we all sort of said, hey, let's take a minute, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we spent the first four years after our first record came out of nonstop touring. Wow. Um, so we, we wanted to take a break, and I kind of needed to figure out what it was I was going to do in that break. And then I got to thinking, well, what if we never get back together? What if hmm. we don't make a record again? What if we don't go on tour? What would I want to do? And, you know, it really all just wanted to be centered around music. Was it going to be trying to produce records or trying to make my own record you know our singer went out and, and made a, a, a few solo records that wasn't something that I really was very interested in I actually sat down and wrote a record you know of me playing and, and singing all the all the um, all the songs and no one has ever heard it nor will anyone ever hear it <laughs> but it was the you know it made me sort of realize that that really wasn't the thing that I really wanted to do so mm -hmm. um, I became friends with Wendy Melvoin and she as she had said hey why don't you come down to the studio and watch what we do and they were working on Heroes and right. working on Crossing Jordan yeah. at the time and I said okay so I, I went and I sort of sat in their studio for like uh, three weeks wow. and I was like wow this is really great this is really I really enjoy this process watching mm -hmm. them do their thing um, and then Wendy was like hey why don't you try your hand at writing a cue and I said, okay. So <laughs> I did, and apparently it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> they impressed um, people. Yeah, and par apparently they were impressed. <laughs> and then, then at that point, they said, like, you know, Lisa um, was about to have a baby. Mm -hmm. And Wendy said, I don't think I can handle doing both these shows at the same time. Why don't you help me with um, Crossing Jordan? And I did, and then just started writing cues. And then doing a whole bunch of other stuff, too, assisting them, uh, you know, recording uh, different musicians and editing right, and doing right. a whole bunch of stuff and just sort of really getting immersed into into the whole thing. Right. And I and immediately was hooked. I was like, this is great. I love doing this. Wow. And that was sort of how I entered into 
getting into this, but it was very, I was very lucky that I sort of got to transition from one, you know, insular career to another, Yeah. you know, um, with, but it, it took a while, you know, it, yeah. it, it, that was in 2007. Um, and, uh, and now you have your juggling now. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, now I'm doing, now I'm doing a lot. Now I'm, it, yeah. I'm definitely up to my neck in it, but it, it was two years or so before I met Noah. Right. The who hired me on my thing. yeah with these creator of Fargo and he hired me in my on my first of my own job you know like that I wasn't working either collaborating with somebody else or right. helping out as an additional music writer or you know something that somebody else had got it was my first like oh I'll do a demo yeah and then I went and had a meeting and then got hired wow um, and immediately flew to New York to do that um, so yeah I mean that was sort of the entryway into the whole thing wow yeah, it was very very interesting and yeah, super, super right place, right time, right I person, know. right music, you know. And we're talking, I talked that with a lot of other people, that it has to be this balance of, is it either luck or is it talent? I think it has to be both. I, I say this all the time. It's definitely right place, right time, right, right. music, right people. There's so many right. th um, right. elements that need to all come together to begin the thing. Right. You know, <laughs> and it's with every project that yeah. every project is like that. And and then as you do more and more and more, um, some of the other things sort of fall away. It's mm -hmm. like uh, it because you already know those people. So it may not be who, you know, because you already know those people, you know, right, then right, it may right. just be like, well, is are you the right person to make the music for this particular project? And it's easier to get a job that way. Right. Um, but um, it really so many, so many things have to be in concert quite literally right. in order for um <laughs> for it to happen it's uh luck is a lot a big part of it yeah. yeah so you are i mean fast forward now 2015 which is a, fuck is it 2015 you're you're, you're <laughs> a huge slate man i mean look at uh, your huge slate i mean some of your shows manhattan the return battle creek complications the tut miniseries extent cc csi fiber fargo power i mean as a wow. Yeah. <laughs> did you know? Yeah, did you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I did. I did. How do you juggle? I mean, when you're scheduling that, I mean, that's, you're talking about everything coming together and this kind of like storm of work. I mean, not only just the time that you need to dedicate yourself to it, but how do you process in your mind to, I guess, organize it in your head when you're creating this music in all these different worlds? Um, wow. Well, collaboration is key. Right. Um, you know, on a number of the shows you 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 mentioned, I had you know co-writers mm -hmm. that I that I That's created right, yeah. the music with, like the Returned and a Manhattan I do with Zoe Keating, who mm -hmm. I love working with. She's such a fantastic writer and and such a fantastic cellist. CSI Cyber I do with a good friend of mine, Ben Dechter. Mm -hmm. A lot of the other things, like you know, I have I have an assistant. Um, his name is Jordan, and he he writes additional music that is so important to me because it's like there's no if I need to write. 280 minutes of music in a very short time it's it's literally impossible to do right. so you know there i try to write big themes and then you get help from your from your and and then i have uh, you know three other people who work work for me editing Mateas is um, one of my editors and um, a couple of other assistants making sure that like the schedule gets taken care of right and because if if somebody doesn't tell me what i have to work on i will literally at some point not know what yeah. things now i was i got very lucky with the amount of work that there was, it all sort of fell right into the right time exactly. There wasn't ever too much um, like work at one time. Yeah, yeah. It was all exactly right. Like, I would say it's almost impossible to do more than three things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And as the year went by, it was like one thing would be done and then another thing would start. So there was right. always like three... And at one point there was four and you can feel it when the fourth <laughs> one hits just before that third one is about to end. Then you're like, oh, I'm never going home. You know, I'm, I'm never going to get home. I'm never going to see my kids. I'm, I'm just going to live in the studio. Right. Um, so it's it's I, you know, it's really about like having a really we, we're a really close knit team here at the studio. And it's. You know, that's really important to have people you trust right. working with you. Um, and, you know, again, you know, to two or three of those were, you know, quite literally collaborations with other composers. Right. So that it's made it easier. Exactly. Um, but, you know, there's still a lot in your mind, like know, trying to I keep everything separate. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. Well, and also yeah, it yeah. can be very creatively freeing. 
You know, like mm-hmm. to write Fargo and then I'm writing that kind of music and then I have to, you know, totally switch gears 180 degrees and write a cue for CSI Cyber, right. you know, or Power, <clears throat> which are, you know, literally completely different types of shows, do completely different types of music. Absolutely. So that to me is something that keeps the, um, the creative mind sort of rolling forward that you don't really get bored. You know, you're, you continue, you're continually writing new types of material. Right. And that's really, really important. You know, I, I think for any, for any writer, like to get stuck doing one thing for a really long time can, can be, it can be, it can get monotonous after a while and and people do it and it's a wonderful job to have, but to, to keep the, to keep the, um, the creative juices flowing, it's nice to be able to just switch gears completely. And I can do that in the middle of a day. And that, like, sometimes you get stuck, like you're writing a cue and you really don't know what to do. So it's like, okay, well, I'm going to write this other thing. Hmm. And that can sort of clear the cobwebs out and you jump back and you get that done. That's it's very interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. The way the mind works. And, but, and talking about collaboration, uh, you mentioned Noah Howley uh, yeah. earlier, who was kind of, I mean, you guys are a, t- a force to be reckoned with, I think, a creative force. And uh, I was wondering, because I want to talk a little bit about Fargo, too, I, I kind of in, a little bit in detail, because it is one of my favorite shows on TV. And I think what you guys are doing is superb. Thank you. And um, so talk about that collaborative process. I know we were talking a little bit before about you guys have a shorthand and everything, but I mean... Is it literally just uh, you can read his mind, or is it? I mean, how- well, no, no, it's not. It's not quite. It's not quite like that. But you know, it, we built it up over many years right. of working together, and and um, it's it's more about like when we sit and talk about a project, he sort of gives me an overview as to the feel that he wants, and he'll he'll send me music to listen to, stuff that he's listening to, stuff that he likes, mm-hmm. where the vibe of something is very much what he's looking for. Right. Um, so that helps sort of helps guide me. And then when we talk about music, I mean, he can speak in the vernacular. So he, mm-hmm. cause he's a musician, he can say, you know what, like something really dissonant, maybe with some minor chords here. Like, have you tried mm-hmm. maybe, you know, maybe there was one cue I wrote for the first season that he was like, you know what, this is great. Let's slow it down, drop the whole thing an entire octave. And like, those are notes that are, totally easy to do it's like okay i can do that slow it down drop it an octave (laughs) done um and then i sit back and listen to it and go yeah that's a great that is a great note it's a great idea It's it's a very musical way of trying to get what he wants without changing the creative too much Mm -hmm. um and, you know, occasionally he'll say, you know, like, this is really great, but it's just not working for me. Why don't you just try it in this other way? And I guess like he feels that when I do something, I'm always pretty close to what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that's why he continues to (laughs) want me to do music for him because when he says I'm thinking about something like that and then I do it and it's that thing that he was that hearing in his head, that it, it, it's really meaningful for him. So, um, we have a way of just chatting about it. He, he has said to me on a, on a number of occasions, you know, that thing that you did in that one place that one time, do that again here. And I'll go, I'll know exactly what he's talking about. <laughs> and then I'll go to the studio, do it, and then send it to him, you know, and I get one word answers. Great. Perfect. You know, that, that's it. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, so, and that kind of, uh, that kind of collaborative relationship between a producer and or director and a, and a composer is really important and very rare. Right. You know, Absolutely. so many times, yeah, yeah. So many times, creators of this kind of content don't really have a musical vernacular, so it's more of trying to figure out what they mean. Right, and you he's know? not just a producer. I mean, he's writing and directing, and he, this, yeah. is, this is like a... And these, these he's, know, an auteur, he's definitely an auteur. He's an auteur. Yeah, and definitely. So are you, and, and but together, you guys are... That's Thank why you. I think the show comes together so well. But. You know, he, the, he puts together a team that's pretty fantastic. I mean... His director of photography and right, and yeah. the editing and the whole team. The, I mean, he is a genius at putting a team together, including casting and everything. Yeah. So, um, I feel like we're our shows. The shows that we have done are always going to be greater than the sum of their parts. You mm-hmm. know, and when you put the right people together, it's yeah. it's magic. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so with Fargo, we're on season two right now. We're about. A little bit more than halfway through, so yes, at least for are. me as the viewer, I mean, episode you, six, you know what's coming, but <laughs> <laughs> indeed I do. Uh, so, um, 
the season, I mean, it's an anthology series. It's a completely different story than what season one is. It's kind of in the universe uh, of it. Um, stylistically, though, the music is very different than what you did for season one, but it's still in that, I don't know, it's hard to describe that. It is in that world still, and it feels like Fargo, but I immediately noticed it, it's, it's how, how, do you, how did you guys determine what the sound of this is? Did you treat it as a sequel? Did you treat it as a completely different thing? There was a rule. No season one themes. No season one themes. Except for the main theme. The main theme mm -hmm. stayed. Like, we've used the main theme, I think, only a few times up to yeah, now. I barely... You'll, yeah, yeah. you'll start to hear it more. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the only thing that we kept the same. Everything else, he was like, we're going to write... We need to write all new themes. Because when we went to originally spot um, episode one, and, and, you know, we do something that we don't... They don't normally do in television, which is when we look at a show, we spot it basically without music. Mm -hmm. There's no so, track for no Fargo? Ten. No, because it's we know that we're going to replace it anyway, and we don't want our show to sound like some other right. show. So, yeah. you know, and I always try to tell that to producers, like, hey, you know, if you really want to have a unique show, yeah. don't spot with temp music. I know that you put temp in to try, try to make your edit work, mm -hmm. but if you really want to have something totally different, like, have nothing. Um but uh, we started trying to put some season one themes in because we thought, like, oh, you know, maybe it'll work. Mm -hmm. And then he listened and he was like, you know what? Those pieces of music are so tied to the characters from season one right. that it doesn't really make any sense. And I, I sort of knew that about Malvo's themes because mm -hmm. that was very much him. Yeah, yeah. You know, but there were some general themes from season one that I thought, oh, maybe we could use um, some of these thematic elements. And as we watched it, we realized that we couldn't. And then he looked at me, he was like, you got to write all new themes. And the, 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 the fact was that I had already written about 40 minutes of thematic music already just for season two. Wow. I'd written a Peggy and Ed theme. I'd written a Skip Sprang theme. I'd written a theme for Simone. Um, but there was an edge that he wanted that, we, that I hadn't touched upon yet. And it was very much a... Um, it was very... Uh, he wanted it to feel more German in nature mm -hmm. because the, the Gerhards are a German family and it, it sort of had a little bit more anger to it. Right. Um, he started sending me a bunch of music, um, some some Mahler um, stuff I listened to. I, I give a little tip of the hat to, mm -hmm. to, to Mahler. And um, and some other some other pieces of music and some 70s music. Of course, you know, You yeah. I, I was sort of raised in that, um, in that era, so I, I sort of really knew what that could sound like. So yeah. there, are, you'll hear in episode eight, There's there are a couple of cues that are very 70s. Um, from a film score perspective and from just a pop music perspective right. and songs. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So... How do you spot... I mean, how do you work... I know there's a lot of... There are directors out there, Emma, um, that kind of stand out, like Michael Mann, who like to use songs, and I like to talk to their composers, because how do you kind of work around that in that when you spot it, do you, do you know exactly where the song is going to be when you're already scoring it? I mean, is that the first thing you guys do, is lay out the, the mapping of Well, we watch the, the show. We watch the episode dry, and mm -hmm. but we stop after each act, and we're like, you know, maybe we should go... Let's go watch that one scene again. Maybe we should put some music here. Okay. Then let's put some music here. And, you know, one of the things that we always talk about is we, we never want to play music until we earn it. Right, and, right. And, you know, so, so many times, like, you know, filmmakers will use music in order to help the narrative. We try to underscore the narrative and become more of a character, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we don't want to push the narrative. We don't want to try to make the audience feel what they're supposed to feel. It's right, like, right. if you're going to feel it, we'll feel it. And once we've earned that, then play music. You know, right, right. silence is golden. Um, and there, in, is a, there is great moments of silence. And th that only serves to make the music more impactful when mm -hmm. it comes in. You know, it's if if you've thirty eight minutes of music in a forty two minute show, nobody's paying attention to the music because it's always there. Right. It's like white noise. Um, when when you use music really um, elegantly, you know, then it's a. a it makes the music more have more of an impact and mm -hmm. make it makes it more important. We we learned that, or I learned that very early on in season one, where we really let the shots establish themselves yeah. and then play music. Um, and that's that's been sort of hallmark of the way we we spot these two shows. Um, but speaking more on the fact, you know, you're talking about uh, the amount of music used in Fargo, and and you know. TV is this medium, and we're, everyone says we're in the golden age of television, you know, the auteurs are there making the, the anthology series, are kind of thriving. Um, but a lot of television, I don't, and it, whether it's 
broadcast or cable or whatever, it's, I would say it's a lot of them are very sparsely scored. And while you, I think Fargo has more music than you tend to hear in some, I mean, even Game of Thrones, when it's a big epic, it's, there's a lot of silence there. Um, is that something that you notice or that uh, when you work on your other shows where maybe music is not needed as much in certain, in certain types of series or genres? Do you feel like you have more of a canvas uh, with Fargo, with Noah, working with Noah? Well, you know, Noah will write scripts and sort of script music into the scripts. Mm -hmm. And he'll also, you know, there will be these long swaths of picture without dialogue, which sort of allows for music right. to do something. You know, so many times you're just under underscoring dialogue and it's mm -hmm. like, so you can't do anything. You just have to sort of be there. Um, which happens a lot in television. I think that the things, you know, shows like, like Game of Thrones, which, frankly, I haven't really watched. I've seen a few episodes, right, right. and I think that it's great music, and oh, yes. the way it's done is really beautiful. Um, I think they employ the same ethic, mm -hmm. you know, which is don't play music until you've earned it. Earned it. Yeah, yeah. And when you've earned it, make it count, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, so many times, like, you know, you talk about, you were saying, like, the difference between cable versus broadcast networks, and it's like, you know, I've worked on shows on broadcast networks where it was, there was a 42-minute show, and then I looked at the cue sheet, and the cue sheet said there was 43 minutes of music, and I was like, how is it possible that there's more music than picture? And, in, you know, in fact, it was, like, overlapping cues, and, right. but the, the point is that that music is sort of an afterthought. It's mm -hmm. not even, it's just there to help keep pace. Right. Um, I feel like a lot of those shows don't let it, they just don't let the music do what it should do. Right. It, it, it is a style of filmmaking and a style of TV making that is totally reasonable and it works and people watch it and it's still entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, it's more difficult because it takes a lot more time. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then you have less time to really think about it. You know, right. you it's then your first your first try is your only try. Right. You know, your first time doing a cue is your only one until mm -hmm. you get a note. Um, so I don't know. I, I think that I think that every show in every project has its own dictation. Like yeah. it will dictate what it wants, what it needs. It's and just, you know. I don't know. The flow of Fargo is. Just, I love the way. I mean. It, and I think it is you do strike that balance of earning the music because, like, when you you notice I, the last episode during those, and you guys do the split screens a lot, mm -hmm. and the kind of the wipes and everything, and you're scoring those just it's really in sync with everything, and then it will stop, and then it'll set you into the scene, right? And then so it's definitely very meticulous. I'm uh, going back though to Fargo, and I just I don't know why I didn't notice this or why it just came to me. I mean, because the original film to me is a western. A hidden western. Do you do you see Fargo as a western? The way I mean, there's cops, there's there's you know war, like, all, dueling families. There's I, I've never really thought about it like that. This last episode, I was looking at, it, I'm like, this is very western. Like they're standing off by. Well, the, we, so know. we opened with a western, right? With right. the whole the whole first episode, the the first you know four minutes is you you enter into this. Ronald Reagan movie that's right. a western yeah. um, and that was the actually the first time you heard the, the main theme but it was redone as a, a big 50s western style score right, right. Um, so now that you mention it I guess it does sort of have that sort of leaning yeah, it's I've never really thought about thought about it that way I sort of thought about it more like a, a very um, I, I look at it more Fellini-esque like it's just yeah. so absurd you know, it's maybe an absurd Western, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, but that, to me, is very, you know, very much what life is, because life is very absurd. Like, things right. happen in life, and you're just like, holy shit. And that happens all the time. I mean, maybe there aren't, like, big, huge massacres. <laughs> I mean, there are. There are. You know, which is a, a terrible tragedy. But the way it happens in Fargo seems so... It, it's weird, because it does feel like out it, there. it could be happening, but it also feels like that... Far, that world just exists in a bubble right. as well. Just above just, the, the, the universe that we live in. Right. Like, just above is the Fargo universe. But I love that you guys employ the, that same thing that um, the Coen brothers did in the movie where they open it saying that it's everything is true. Right. <laughs> have yeah. you, have you, has anyone we still get, you? yeah, we still get, I still get questions. Like, that's true? It's <laughs> a real story? Like, you know, no. no. It's a plot device. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm glad that you're in it. But yeah, that's what it does. It, but if you didn't know it, it does uh, take you in it. Right. Um, 
So besides television, um, you do a lot of other work, and we talked about your performing. Uh, you also write, uh, which also interests me, uh, for ballet. Yeah, I did. I did a ballet a while back, and that was that was sort of also before I really got into doing a lot of film and television. And the great thing about that was I they gave me. I went. I went to to New York to see the dancers dance. Mm-hmm. They had done most of the choreography before the music had been written. So I got to score the dance, which was sort of backwards. N- nine times out of ten, it's the composer is making the music and then they choreographed the music. In this particular case, this particular choreographer, her name was Jen Ballard, she had um, come up with this. It's like fourteen minutes um, of of. Um, choreography and she had asked me she said do you think it's possible to write to the to the choreography and I was like well yeah why why not I I'd need to come and see it and then film it and then so I can you know see how it's happening and find out what the tempo is and how they're moving and, right. and all that stuff and it, it ended up working out really well it was the only time I'd done that um, but that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. But it was again, like I said, it was backwards, which I think is but what. What did they? Uh, did she choreograph to another music, or it was just just in her mind? Just in her mind. Yeah. So the dancers just had to feel the movements and just right to silence. Yeah. Wow. I'm not sure how they kept tempo, yeah. but when I wrote the piece, I found myself making these really enormous tempo changes mm-hmm. in order to really keep up with what the what the dancers were doing. But it was it was um, it was really really a challenge. But and it took a while. It took like eight months. Wow. But um. To write a 14 and a half minute long piece, which is, you know, you don't think of taking that. Well, it was it was going back to New York and seeing it again and again and filming it and then seeing how it was evolving because it was evolving. And then finally, when I finished the piece of music and then brought it to them and they danced to the music, it was like it was pretty incredible seeing it for the first time. Wow. You know, anyway. But would you ever go back to that? I mean, is that something you'd go back to or is that, you know, Eventually, that sounds like something that would be cool, mm-hmm. but I'm really enjoying what I'm doing right yeah. now. So <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, if somebody said, "Hey, do you want to write a piece of music for um, for a ballet or dance or or anything?" I, I you know, I might say, "Well, yeah. Let me mm-hmm. let me try and let me try and figure out when I can do that." But I am pretty happy, yeah. you know, <laughs> watching Fargo and watching these shows and writing music for for the t- uh, for the TV. <laughs> So just kind of looking at the entire process, the entire process, of whatever, the, whatever the show is, and I'm sure it's different for every show, but what is the most exciting part of your job like that you look forward to with every project, everything? What is that point there in that kind of timeline that you go, yes, we're at this point. I love it. Getting the job. Getting the job? Getting I think the phone so. Call? Really? Get, getting, the, getting the job and knowing that I... Because usually if I really want a job, if I really... If I'm, if I'm um, you know on the road of trying to get a job or someone has told me about a project and I've read the script and I really like it and I really want I, I'm all of a sudden I start writing music in my brain the moment I hear about something that I'm interested in mm-hmm. so that whole time like figuring out what that sounds going to be thinking about like oh maybe I could get that one special instrument and how would that sound and wh- how am I going to build that and what's that melody going to be that whole process is really, really uh, inspiring. Wow. So from that up to the moment of, okay, you're, you're hired, we're doing it, mm. that's sort of the culmination of all of what's going on in my head. Then, of okay. course, like writing the music and like getting into it, that's great too, but right. it's, it's sort of like that's at the crest, yeah. and it stays up there for a while. Um, With that initial, I guess, like spark of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. The initial spark of ideas on any project is always the most thrilling for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, as I put it into motion, now when I do Fargo and any any project that employs a um, uh, an orchestra, mm-hmm. that happens again because sure. then I'm writing it, I'm writing, I'm writing it, and then all of a sudden someone is performing it, and that's another thrill, very thrilling moment, like seeing an orchestra perform music that you've written. is It's a pretty thrilling thing. Mm-hmm. Or, or not not even just an orchestra, any amount of people, even just like a guitar player yeah. or a pianist. <laughs> or I had a, um, I had a guy in here playing um, the world, so I had written this piece of music for Fargo, a very 70s sort of funky piece. And when he sat down and played it, that was totally thrilling to me. <laughs> and I'd written it like two days before, and I was like, yeah, this is all right. This is cool. Let's and then it. he sits down and plays it, and it's just like, 
fuck, that's amazing. Right. I could never do it like that. <laughs> you know, um, same with, you know, an orchestra or quartet in there or whatever. That's also extremely thrilling. Then, of course, seeing it all finished. Like, that's always thrilling, too. Like, I watched... I got home last night pretty late, and I watched a DVR version of, of Episode 6, which I'd seen 10,000 times yeah. before, but there's nothing like seeing how other people are going to see it. Right. Because I never see a fully done, colorized, you know, fixed picture. You know, I don't ever see it like that. I see it at the final mix, which is just like a temp-colored version, and you don't ever see it right. until it's aired. But I mean, I, I'm not going back and watching the DVD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I, I don't know if you do this. I do this, too, when I'm... Uh, if I'm editing something or if I'm knowing someone else is going to watch it for some reason I'll watch it and somehow I don't know how to describe it in my head I kind of imagine the other person watching it right. and what they would experience so it's like you're not in your own head you're like right. that's exactly how they're watching it I think right. it's a completely different yeah. experience that way but <laughs> and, that's, and that's also thrilling yeah. yeah so if that's the most exciting part what is the most challenging part the one that's like god fuck that's the most like tedious or is there anything that you just want to get through that uh, has to be done or that it kind of makes you hit a wall well you know yeah doing little pieces mm -hmm. little cues like if there's an 18 second transition uh -huh. those kinds of things it's very difficult to sort of try to be musical in a very short span mm -hmm. so at some point, those kinds of things start to feel non-musical, and they start to feel non-artistic. It's just sort of like, now I'm just using the craft. Right. And I would I, I would just say that that's just not as much fun, you know. And that's where you're doing a job. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's no longer like, oh, I'm just an artist. I'm yeah. just having fun <laughs> painting with my paints. You know, it's it's more of like the okay, this is I have to do this, and this needs to go here, and okay, done. Right. And then try to move on. Um, you know, a lot of it when you're actually into the scoring aspect of it, that's when the craft really becomes important, mm -hmm. you know. Um, because writing music is really wonderful and really great, but like using your craft to like make your art work in a certain situation. Right. It's, it's really that sort of meeting of being a true creator of art and then also figuring out how to make that art into something that is usable for what you're doing right. you know so and now looking back at switching your little uh, to get back to your tour uh, when you tour when you're playing with your band mm. you've traveled and what's your husband your your favorite city that you got to travel on tour to? oh i mean we've, we've several maybe but yeah with the, we've been to so many like you know i've had so many wonderful wonderful experiences everywhere yeah you know it's hard to it's hard to say i'm i'm does it, does, does it just kind of blend into one big thing yeah like, it's like at home tour <sighs> well touring it's like i have many many memories many specific memories of things that have happened mm -hmm. on the road some good some not so good um we were uh one that sticks out in my mind is that we were we were in Paris on my birthday, which was August thirty first, nineteen ninety seven, playing a show, um, and we were done playing the show and we went to walk back to the hotel and we saw that there were police everywhere on the street and got back into my hotel and that was the night that Princess Diana was killed, oh, wow. and we had walked right by the the accident yeah. had happened right after our show and we walked by and then you know we then the next morning we got on a train and went to London because we were going to shoot a video in London and all this you know all this memory of everything that was going on sort of you know mm -hmm. is a part of that big sort of wash of memories right. but um, I remember getting getting to, to London and the car taxi driver was crying because when we left she hadn't died she was still in the hospital like 4.30 in the morning, which is mm -hmm. when we left um, Paris to go to London on the train. By the time we got to London, apparently she had died. Wow. And then, so that that kind of thing, like those kinds of experiences, really, really big experiences, like as a part of being on tour. Right. And experiencing that is was is just really, you know, has, has emblazoned itself upon my brain. Mm -hmm. You know, um... So for that, Paris is it holds a big, uh, a big memory That's for me, a really, yeah, really yeah. significant memory because it was such a brilliant time, it was such a w amazing time in person. Then that happened, right. making that completely unforgettable. Wow. Like, 
you have these experiences and they're really great and then something so major happens that it's something that you can never forget for the rest of your life. Right. You know, those those things are, are really big. So, you know, Paris is is a place. London is, is obviously um, a place. Uh, we've had really, really fantastic shows all over the world. Yeah. We played in Poland. Wow. Actually, not too long ago to like 450,000 people. That was... We had never played in Poland before and we show up and like people are... You know, there's 400,000 people there to see this show that we were playing and we were we were pretty we were pretty surprised um so that that kind of thing really i mean yeah really is very memorable <laughs> outside of this this room this where you what, what you do in here i don't really you, get you out don't of get this out but when much. you do get out of this room what are things what are hobbies you like to do besides music and anything that you do to kind of creatively refresh or to relax i it? i have two children and i dad, love dad duties yeah i love hanging out with them like go play soccer with my son or yeah just hanging out with my kids which is very much a total reset you know right. um but i don't have a lot of time <laughs> and I, I mean so so the time i do have i i want to spend with them give it to your family. um because any other time i have i usually am going out playing shows that's kind of like the hobby now you well, know it's yeah, like going out and true. playing yeah. shows with the band um is more like the respite Mm -hmm. than it is the work yeah you know the work is here um and i love doing it and then i get to go on you know play shows with the band that's kind of like a vacation yeah so <laughs> that's kind of like the thing well i mean there are other things i love to do i love to ski oh i don't really well, get to ski when was the last time you went skiing i mean a few years ago okay. <laughs> yeah you know as it hasn't been and i'd like to try to go skiing this this winter as a matter of fact i've been sort of yeah. threatening the people who work here in the studio to, to for us all to go on a ski trip to just to find out that yeah. that they don't <laughs> ski and i'm like well what good are you if you're not gonna ski all right you know um so it's it's hard to say it's like I'm kind of a tech geek, so I, you oh, know, yeah. like love keyboards and computers and all that stuff. So it's like <laughs> I get to do my hobby, the things that I love at work. Right. So I, you know, that so doesn't leave much time for anything else. Exactly. Yeah. So your your hobbies are your work. That's that's a, it's a, a blessing too. Right. Yeah. It is. Uh, it is. I'm very I'm very lucky that that's the case. Yeah. So yeah. to to kind of wrap up, uh, looking back, is there something that you learned that you wish you knew at the beginning of your career as a composer that you, you learn down the road that you wish you could tell your younger self like all right this is a very valuable lesson you should have known this some of the things you know it's it's interesting i've been asked that question before and the good thing about having had a career prior to this part of my career mm -hmm. is that a lot of those questions were answered in that previous incarnation of what i was doing mm -hmm. right um so i there's a I would like to say that w what I always understood was checking your ego at the door. Like, there's no room for ego. Right. And I learned that really early because you start in a rock band and you have a big <laughs> hit. You're like the biggest fucking egotistical person. And, I, and that, that was early. Yeah. And that changed. Right. Like, you sort of learn, like, oh, the ego, get rid of that because it's only going to make it more difficult for you. And mm -hmm. I learned that, you know, before I ever even stepped foot in a... A, a composer studio um, so I sort of knew that going into this I was always very much like oh, okay whatever you know whatever needs to be done right. you know it's not you know I know a lot of people were like I'm not changing it it's my music and yeah. I, I don't look at it like that because because I'm um, I come from being in a band which is collaboration which I feel is, like yeah it's yeah. all a collaboration. Yeah. Music is collaboration. Of like course. yeah, you can sit in a, in a studio and write a piece of music in a bubble and it could be great. Um, and that's great. You should record it and put out a record, you know. But when you're when you're making music for someone else's medium, you know, when a director is making a, a movie, you know, he's making a movie based on somebody's words. I'm writing music based on somebody's pictures and words. Right. You know, it's like it's all a collaborative effort. Yeah. And I think that I learned also how to collaborate very early. You know, which is, important. which is very important. Yeah. It, it is very important. You know, it, you, you can't you can't let your ego you can't let your ego be bruised either. If, you know, like you get notes. It's like, oh, yeah. OK, you know, I know people I, I know people and I know I felt this, too. Like, you know, I get a note on a, on a piece of music and I'm like, oh, you know, I really liked it that yeah, way. Right. I really thought it was really good. <laughs> I thought for sure I was going to give this cue and he was going to be like, oh, this is great. <laughs> and then, you know, you get that note like this isn't working. Right. And 
my first response is, oh, it's not? Yeah. Um, not not to anybody else, but to, to myself. Yourself, you know, I'm like, it's not working. I'll have to watch it again. I want to understand what's going on. Right. And then if I'm able to, like, separate myself from my ego, I can go, okay, I have to have a completely, you know, objective point of view here not and not be subjective about it. Right. Um, and pull myself out of it and listen to listen to it with their ears. Right. Um, that's a big sort of ego, super ego thing, you know, just needing to have that balance. You learn that pretty, you learn that pretty quickly. Pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> because no one's ever going to allow you, no one's ever going to hire you if you're like, no, I'm not right. going to do that. Do like another, a right. whole line of people. That would exactly. A very long line. Very long line. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jeff, uh, thank you so much for your time. It's been such a pleasure uh, to, to chat and uh, really love the work you're doing. So. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks.